Hospital trauma rooms are places of panic and fear for their patients. So a reassuring voice or a consoling hand are two of the most critical things a trauma nurse can offer. That's somebody. That's somebody's brother, mother. Like 18-year-old David, caught in a fight that quickly escalated to a gunshot. And a new mother hit head-on after swerving to keep her new family out of harm's way. When you're rushing to CT or rushing to the OR, all you're thinking is, oh God, please just let us get there. severely injured patients, those facing death or the catastrophic loss of the ability to move or function normally, land in the trauma room. And right alongside the trauma team leaders and doctors are dedicated trauma room nurses. What does it take to work day in and day out in a place of such fear and suffering, of pain and hope? A certain type of character ends up working in this type of area and being an adventurous nature I think has a lot to do with it and the continuous go 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 that we always complain about tends to be what draws us here a lot of the time. There's uh, you know high levels of burnout in emergency medicine and it's for that reason that it is that go go environment that uh, that draws certain types of people and that's what drew me here. That go go environment is about to pick up for Russ, a five year veteran in the trauma room. EMS are rushing in a young shooting victim, and the team quickly assembles. I heard one gunshot. This will be kind of crazy here for two minutes, OK? OK. Everybody's here to help you. This is Richard. He's a 17-year-old male. He says he was in an elevator. He's confronted with a man with a, uh, a silver tank gun. Heard one shot. David was followed into his girlfriend's apartment building by a young gang of hot-headed teens bent on violence. While in the elevator, he was shot in the chest at close range. Originally, we had a poultry He uh, went up nine flights, made his way to an apartment uh, room, and uh, called for help from there. He has one entrance wound, two finger widths, medial to his right nipple. He's complaining of shortness of breath. On auscultation, he's got breast sounds on the left side, upper right, but no breast sounds below the gunshot. When the patient arrives, we're assessing for, of course, airway, breathing, and circulation. With somebody who's a shooting victim, the first thing you want to make sure of is that they are able to get air in. If there's a leak of air outside of the lung, in between the rib cage and the lung, or else bleeding into that area, then you have uh, a breakdown in that mechanical ability to draw air in. Pain in the chest? The team thinks the position of the entry wound suggests the bullet has ripped through David's lung. Unseen paramedics inserted a Heimlich valve to release air that, if trapped in his chest, could crush his injured lung. It's a short-term solution that won't hold for long. His pulse rate has dropped a bit, and his last pressure was 98. But before the team can do anything, there's trouble. When people start vomiting and retching like that, it's dangerous because you can't have them lying flat on their back. But at the same time, you don't know the point of entry and, or exit and what kind of damage there is internally. You don't want them moving around too much. Come back over here, Rich, for a minute, OK? Come on. You got to get you hooked up first, OK? The team can't afford any more delays in getting David breathing properly. This is going to hurt a lot. You're getting some burning in your chest. OK, we've got to put a chest tube in, OK? All right. Trapped air is compressing David's lungs, so the team's got to release the pressure with a chest tube. That'll help your breathing a lot, okay? It hurts going in, though. We're giving you some breathing right now so it doesn't hurt as much, okay? It's a routine maneuver in the trauma room, but with each breath hard for David to make, the team has to do it fast. As David's nurse, Russ, knows, it's all about the moments and seconds. Is get so being prepared is, is a very big thing. Something as, as little as not having a a scalpel in the proper place. When it comes down to minutes and that scalpel is missing, it could be much more of a big deal. The adrenaline works better than coffee, for sure. And the adrenaline does run high. The chest tube is both tricky and painful, and the chance of deadly infection skyrockets. They've got no choice. Keeping air going for David is needed to keep him alive. You're doing well, man. You're doing OK. Just going to cover you up with some blankets, OK? In, in every case across the board, when people come in and they're conscious, fear is one of the biggest pains that they're dealing with. How many punches did you take? 20. Yeah. 
it's a very scary situation being in an environment like this. It's kind of like being on stage naked in here. In a lot of ways, it's just consoling the person and trying to make a you know a connection with them at a level where they feel that they can trust you, and then they're able to listen to what you're saying. Have you done your collarbone before? Have you thrown punches as well? The priority, of course, is to, to just uh, to ensure that the patient is you know progressing towards a positive outcome. But David is not progressing towards a positive outcome. How you doing? Richard, talk to me. What's the matter? Talk to me. I'm hard to breathe. Okay, we're working on it. Trauma team leader Dr. Brzezowski arrives just as the chest tube is inserted. Breathing getting better at all? But for reasons unknown to the team, despite the chest tube, David still isn't breathing well. And there's blood in the tube. A frightening clue pointing to a lung injury. Deep breath. It is impossible to know what damage the bullet has inflicted beneath the skin. For example, if you have um, what we call a tension pneumothorax, where there's, there's air between the chest wall and the lung, and the lung is actually being compressed to the point that the patient can't breathe for themselves, you basically asphyxiate and, and will die. David's trouble breathing could spiral out of control. The trauma team's got to find the bullet's path. The clock is ticking. Deep breath. Did you get the extra done? Yeah. Okay, that's good. That's good. Okay. As crucial members of the team, trauma nurses are a breed apart. As adept at juggling chaos as they are at keeping vital signs on track and pain in check while trying not to miss a beat. You have uh, at least one nurse at the bedside and one charting, preferably two nurses if you have it. You'll notice one's always hanging back, trying to record everything we need, get access to all the drugs we need, get a hold of all the people we need, make sure that nothing is missed. And as you'll see, the other nurse is absolutely vital too because they're up helping us get all the IVs in in order to give the medications, handing up the equipment, helping people give the medicines and do everything else. So essentially, we, we can probably run the trauma without a couple of the doctors here, but we cannot run the trauma without the nurses. And Dean is one of them. A veteran trauma room nurse, Dean gets the call to action. Moments from now, emergency crew will rush in a victim of a high-speed car crash. Dean has to call in the trauma team leader. But in the meanwhile, resident Dr. Jordan Chenkin finds out from EMS how Laura got into trouble. She's a healthy 36-year-old, but she's three months postpartum. Okay. But uh, was the restrained driver the head-on collision at highway speed? While out on the highway driving, Laura swerved to avoid an oncoming car. It took emergency crews one hour to get her out, while her husband and new baby were luckily spared. He has a compound left femur, right tip fib, right humerus, canal palpation of the pelvis. What's your name? Does she have some ID? Laura. Just bear with us. There's going to be lots of stuff happening at once here, okay? Laura has severe exposed fractures that need urgent surgery but she may also have torn vessels that now bleed into her pelvis, and she could lose a limb from lack of blood supply. But she can't get to surgery, not yet. High-speed crashes often cause internal damage, so the team of nurses and doctors have to search for signs of a bleed. They'll have to search quickly before committing her to hours in OR. If the team skips this step, and Laura's in surgery for her fractures. A silent bleed could rob this young woman's infant daughter of her mother. Called crashing, a patient like Laura can spiral from stable into death very fast. So Dean's got to be on the lookout for the slightest evidence of instability. Sometimes there could be 10, 12, a dozen people around you. It's bad enough being in a strange place with being naked and being exposed. So it's just a nice thing to say, hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm the nurse looking after you. Just relax. You're always going to be in good hands. So I think it's just realizing that that could be your mother, your father, your brother, your sister there. While still in street clothes, trauma team leader Talat Chugtai's arrived to complete the ultrasound check on Laura. What's hurting right now? Oh, you can get a very good look at the fast on the left. I suspect there may be some air under there. Maybe. You can't feel your tummy. Uh, if I don't touch it. Are you going to use the x-ray? I know. I need this. Dean, I'm done here. Sorry. 
That, that it could be within the liver itself. Yeah. Well, I mean, you never know. Yeah. yeah. I I agree. Agree. Okay, we're gonna call the fast uh, maybe positive on the right upper quadrant. The ultrasound is positive for a bleed. It's what Dr. Chugtai feared and could signal that vital organs like the spleen or liver have been lacerated. But no one yet knows for sure. And until they do, the team will have to assume the worst and work fast to prevent this new mother from bleeding to death. Well, there's always a little bit of adrenaline because you never know what's going to come through the door. Like, I want traumas all, all the time. I would love to be the trauma nurse every day. Trained to be ready for anything that comes through the door, nurses have to act in split seconds and always be one step ahead of the life-saving needs of their patients. Nurses are absolutely a crucial members of the team. Try to run a trauma without a nurse, and then you really learn what they contribute to the, to the whole process. Looks like mass chaos. It is, but it's actually quite organized when you're doing it. It just seems like they're running around like chickens with their heads cut off. Few qualify for this kind of nursing. It is not meant for the faint of heart or stomach. I love my job. I look forward to coming. I love it. Every day I come into my job, I don't know what to expect. And often the deadliest injuries are caused by car crashes, like Nurse Dean's patient, Laura. Just three months after giving birth to her first child, Laura was hit in a devastating car crash, so severe that it took over 45 minutes to pull her out from the crumpled metal. Trauma team leader Talat Chugtai has his hands full. He's found evidence of an internal bleed in Laura's abdomen. But it's worse than that. Open femur on the left. Orthopedics have arrived, just in time to look at her many severe open fractures. The femur can bleed quite a bit into the thigh. There's about two liters or even more uh, into each thigh. And uh, there's also high risk of infection as well, because the bones come out into the environment well, and gone back in again. So we're going to gentamize them. So we're going to yeah. Laura's fractures are exposed to infection and need urgent surgery. But she's also leaking blood into her thighs, suggesting a torn vessel that could kill off her limbs. It's already been two hours since uh, the incident, two and a half hours. So, as far as operations for infection, preventing infection, usually you like to do it within six hours. So, we're going to do it. Laura, I'm going to turn you over. I'm going to feel your spine. All available strength is expertly needed from the nurses and residents to get Laura off the back. They have to explore for any signs of spinal fractures. With injuries like Laura's, though, a log roll like this can be the most painful part of being in the trauma room. My arms and my legs are sore. Yeah, we're going to give you some pain medication. Oh, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. No, it's too sore. Yeah. Go in the thought. One, two. Just keep your breathing. Keep breathing. Do you have any pain up here? No. Here? No. Here? Head-on car collision victim Laura has been clear of serious spinal injury. Keep your head straight. We don't know if you have a neck injury or not yet. Dealing every day with people like Laura in excruciating pain can grind staff members down. It's especially hard on the nurses, who take on a comforting role as well, like Dean. We share between each other. We tell stories. Uh, I'm one of those ones that just like to talk about it and say, you know, I wonder if they're going to make it. And that's just an outlet for how we cope with things. Um, we realize how it's kind of lucky we are that, you know, we can kind of come in, assist, and we leave, and we go home. The people in here don't go home. Maybe they're going to be vented for the rest of their life. I mean, who knows? It, that's what makes, makes lucky for us. I treat the trauma that comes in as a technical exercise. I have to be the one who's thinking of the human physiology, what's going on. I'm telling residents what to do. And then the patient kind of gets lost in the mix, but you'll often see in the cases a nurse at the head of the bed explaining to the patient who's awake what's going on. Don't worry, everything's going to be fine. You're going to be taken care of. That's at the same time as doing all those other things that they have to do as nurses. Nurse Dean arranges for Laura's CT scan. 
Ultrasound has confirmed there's internal bleeding into the abdomen. The problem is where and how bad. Another team of trauma nurses and doctors is working hard to get 18-year-old David's breathing stabilized. He's still having trouble despite the emergency insertion of a chest tube to relieve trapped air that's compressed his lung. Less than two hours ago, taunts from a youth gang escalated to an argument. They followed David into the elevator and shot him in the chest. Most gunshots to the abdomen actually have a significant injury, and the path of the bullet is very erratic and unpredictable. Erratic and unpredictable. So a chest x-ray must be done to help the search for the bullet's damage. In the meantime, Nurse Russ has to notify David's family. Give me family contact. Carol? When I was a kid, I don't think we ever would have imagined uh, stabbing someone or shooting someone, maybe beating someone up, and even that was far-fetched, you know? It's sad. Age is always something that always affects me. When you get young people that come in that make decisions that take them maybe down what we would consider to be a wrong path, uh, it's always a bit disturbing. Very hard to deal with sometimes. The youngest I've seen is 14. I mean, to me, they're just like kids. Luckily, with the chest tubes, David's breathing has stabilized and the team can begin to assess his injuries. There's a great deal of uh, force that's emitted from the path of the bullet. So it's not just the hole that it makes, but it creates a lot of energy that can injure organs um, sort of uh, away from the path of the bullet, causing bleeding or perforation of your bowel or other organs. Trauma team leader Dr. Brzezowski has got to check the x-ray to see where the bullet is lodged. Enough, there's the hole, right? So put a scan with them. We see uh, where the path is. Good news and bad. The team has found the bullet, but they haven't any clear idea of its path of destruction. Bullets, we never know where they actually can travel, so it's more, it's safer to do a CT chest. The bullet's sitting outside here. I'm gonna go for a CAT scan, all right? Just take, put you in a big suit, take a bunch of x-rays of your chest. Hopefully, we'll see the path of the bullet nicely. Your mom's in the way as well. The police contacted your mom, okay? So she'll right. be here soon enough. David is alert enough to take in the next step. He'll need more detailed scans to discover what damage the bullets caused. But what he doesn't know, and what the team too will find out, is whether vital organs have been hit. And if so, can trauma surgery help this young man in time? Young lives at risk is becoming an everyday fact of emergency trauma rooms across North America. With the increased violence, you just think, is this going to change? And realistically, we know from our standpoint, when we look at other cities that are, have dealt with this 10 years ago, 15 years ago, where they start to see their numbers increase, this is not going to change for us here in Toronto. Now remember being pumped up a Saturday night, you know, ooh, we're going to get gunshots, ooh, we're going to get gunshots. Now it's Monday morning. Tuesday afternoon, it doesn't matter, and it is, it's sad. It may be more commonplace now for the trauma nurse, but that doesn't mean it's every day for the youth involved. Panic-stricken if conscious, and often terrified and bewildered, it's typically the task of that special breed of nurse to cut through the chaos, to create a small semblance of calm for a patient in serious trouble. On the ride to work, you're always looking around for lights and sirens, and you know, you usually hope that you get here and there's not a state of chaos already in place. You hope that it's quite enough that you can check everything, make sure that the trauma room is ready, and uh, you know, everything is ready to go for when traumas do come. Russ's colleague, charting room nurse Jan, takes a call. An emergency crew is en route with a young victim of a vicious stabbing. In broad daylight in the team's own schoolyard. Hello? 17 year old male, assaulted, stabbed twice. I have laid in a case to be about maybe three, four, and six inches away. 17 year old Carl tried to protect a friend in a schoolyard dispute. When things turned ugly, he was stabbed. Once 
in the abdomen just to the left of the umbilicus. Okay. And once in the left, the uh, lateral chest wall. One more. Hey man, how's your breathing feeling? How's your breathing doing? I need to wipe all the blood in, in my mouth and my Okay, did they hit you at all? Punch once in the face. Okay, you didn't get knocked unconscious or anything? Most. They didn't hit you in the back or in the head or anything? I don't even know where the punch came from. Really know. Yeah. Luke Knapp in the street ran at least 100 yards to the side. Where's this other one? Right here, right here underneath the right under the abdomen. Yeah. Yeah. So here, get closing off first. With stabbings, you're always concerned about where the knife might have hit, what organs may have been affected, or any free fluid that might become or arouse because of the injuries. Going on. Yeah, I'm just checking out your heart doing an ultrasound, okay? You're going to feel some pressure on your chest. Big breath. Does your belly hurt at all when I press around the side? Yeah, only at the bottom of it. Ultrasound shows no internal bleeding. The trauma team leader, Lorraine Tremblay, will take no chances. Plunging her finger into the wound, she finds it's too deep to leave alone. It slices all his muscles in the anterior abdominal wall. We'll probably have to put him to sleep to fix it. How old are you? When I was growing up, I mean, never, I grew up in Toronto, never would have thought about, you know, someone getting shot or someone getting stabbed. I think it's really sad. I mean, regardless of what the person does or the reasons behind, I think it's a really sad situation. I think that society today has changed so much. This cut goes pretty big. The better way to fix it, probably, is to put you sound asleep and fix all the muscles. I don't think it went on the inside. I'm going to see where this one went. We're just waiting for the x-ray back, okay? Dr. Tremblay's made her plan clear. Carl needs to go to the OR. At the very least, the wound is deep enough to have cut through stomach muscles. And once in the OR, the surgical team may well find more damage. Before OR, Dr. Tremblay's check on the x-rays allows her to give Carl some good news for now. Somebody called his turf. Apparently the skull was in the Oh, good. So far, I don't see a collapsed lung. We'll just have to check. If we see any signs that your lung, because trouble's lungs are like balloons. If you get a little hole in it, an air starts like you know, it collapses. Sometimes we have to put a little tube in your side for a couple days. So far, that's not happening though, okay? Thank you so much. They'll send your parents along as soon as they come in. Right now, we're just waiting for an operating room to be ready, okay? So do you understand what that all meant? Uh, yeah. Thank you. And somebody should be calling your mom and dad, or...? The nursing team now has to prep Carl for surgery. <laughs> Nurses, meanwhile, attend to another trauma. Laura, first-time mom to a small infant, is now heavily sedated. Laura's in excruciating pain from extensive broken bones and cuts caused by a high-speed car crash. A trauma nurse travels to CT with Laura. The new mom needs scans to precisely pinpoint whether her spleen or liver have been lacerated, putting her at risk of a galloping bleed. With internal bleeding, Laura could crash at any moment. She needs constant observation. She quite happy part of it. And there is trouble. Laura's heart rate climbs. It's a state called tachycardia. I'm just going to double check and make sure she's fine. She has a lot of reasons for having a high heart rate. She has pain. I mean, the pain that she's having with those fractures must be actually incredible. Her fractures are not just simple fractures. They're all complex fractures, open. So it's causing a lot of pain, I'm sure. However, given that it's a high-speed motor vehicle collision, we have to rule out that she doesn't have a you know, spleen that's bleeding or a liver that's bleeding or a collapsed lung that we're missing on the chest x-ray. So once the scans are done, if she still has a high heart rate, then I'll be able to say that, okay, it's probably due to the pain. But I can't just write it off to that completely yet. Dr. Chuktai confirms what he feared and he'll have some tough decisions to make. Well, I'm actually a little bit surprised, Dave, about this, Peter. Yeah. I... So she has a liver injury and a spleen injury also, which is why we scan these patients. Sure enough, the CT showed worse than what I expected, so. How much blood is in the abdomen, just for... Um, mild to moderate. It's not a, it's not a huge no. amount, Dave. So, 
The decision to make here is whether to operate on her abdomen because she has a spleen laceration and a liver laceration. If her blood pressure drops to less than 100, very, very, uh, I'll be very quick to operate on her and take her spleen out. It's a risky decision, but I think we'll, we'll have to make a decision. I think that's what we're going to make. Only time will tell. But in two hours, Laura will be in surgery to repair her many open fractures. And Dr. Chugtai will need to make an emergency interruption of that surgery if the bleeding gets any worse. It's a controlled chaos. You don't feel pressure because your adrenaline is just so high. Trauma team members have seen it all, especially the nurses who are charged with prepping the trauma room and controlling the chaos. Your heart is kind of beating faster thinking what's coming. At least mine is. But when you're rushing to CT or rushing to the OR, all you're thinking is, oh God, please just let us get there before anything happens. That's what I'm thinking. That's the hope now riding on David, en route now to CT from the trauma room. The 18-year-old was shot at close range in the chest and rushed here to Toronto Sunnybrook Regional Trauma Center. He was with his girlfriend when angry words with a pack of young strangers escalated to gunfire. The team must scan David's chest and abdomen to discover the path of destruction wrought by the bullet. Along with three nurses and as many residents, trauma team leader Mike Brzezowski accompanies the team to the CAT scan. Hey, you just got shot once, right? Dr. Brzezowski uses every moment he can to quiz David about the bullet's entry. Were you able to get up after you got shot? You couldn't walk? How come? You're dizzy? Getting a clear picture now about the bullet's location puts the team that much closer to moving fast to stem its damage. It's rather concerning looking liver. The first glimpse is not good. Definitely a large liver laceration. They find it's his liver that's been lacerated. Looks like it's gone in anteriorly, gone through the liver. Ricocheted off of a rib or something. Never trust a bullet. Never trust a bullet. <laughs> Never trust a bullet. It can go either way. In David's case, it may have ricocheted off his ribs and to his abdomen. And Dr. Brzezowski just wants to leave well enough alone. Once the bullet has stopped moving, the damage is done. So taking the bullet out afterward um, is not going to do anything. In fact, you probably do more harm in trying to remove the bullet by incising the skin and binding it in the muscle or wherever it is at that point. The bullet will be left to work its way to the skin's surface. In the future, it can be removed by a small incision. Still, the teen must be watched closely in hospital in case his liver starts to bleed uncontrollably. The majority of traumas are patients between 18 and 24 years old. Shootings, knife fights, car accidents. David's parents will be given relatively good news tonight. But oftentimes, it's the nurses who talk to families with bad news. I still cry. Lots of times I cry. You know what? It's a patient, and you, you don't know them. But as soon as you see the family, that's when it does me in. It makes me cry now, but it does, because it's just like that's somebody. That's somebody's brother, mother, ever. And many nurses are young themselves and can remember a different time. Early back to when I was a kid, we just didn't even have guns or thought of shooting somebody or being in gangs. Growing up when I was a little girl living in Toronto, I don't think I ever would have imagined someone stabbing me or jumping me. Stab someone once or twice for that matter is just, be it's beyond me. Young Carl may not have been in a gang, but a schoolyard argument turned deadly for him anyway. He's now in OR where trauma surgeon Lorraine Tremblay works hard to stem blood loss and repair damage caused by the vicious knife attack. Just fixing his stab wounds, because they cut all the muscles in his belly. And then we're going to make sure he has no internal injuries. Carl's wounds run deep, and damage to the muscle is bad. 
But before Dr. Tremblay can repair it, she'll have to ensure no other organs were pierced. A barely perceptible tear, if found, could open and leak intestinal contents into the abdomen. If that happens, Carl's body could be overwhelmed with toxicity. This kid's slashed like this, and you see all his muscles here. But I think he's also sat back there, so we have to look at his diaphragm. And we're not holding on there. First, the surgical team looks for the path of the knife. It goes up further than my finger. And it goes further than expected. The possibility of life-threatening internal injury just became a little more real. Carl's intestines now have to be thoroughly examined, like a needle in a haystack. Even the tiniest injury there could have serious complications. Okay, and then you never know when penetrating trauma if you're bleeding or not. Okay. But, you know, he, once you've got an injury and penetrating trauma, you just bring them to the OR. And right. There's the whole cut. Mm -hmm. uh, no diaphragm injury. So we did a trauma lap, but he has no diaphragm. But he did slice his interior wall, which is what we came to fix. Somehow, Carl's made it through a knife attack without any organ damage. Now, Dr. Tremblay's got to repair the severed stomach muscles and close the wounds. Carl will have to stay in the intensive care unit to recover. Once there, nursing staff will be on the lookout for a toxic infection that could still cost him his life. You always feel a little bit more settled when someone leaves, knowing, OK, they're stable. But there's always that possibility that something might happen. At Sunnybrook Regional Trauma Center, Canada's largest, there's no shortage of traumas. They treat here 1,000 annually, and one of them is on its way in, so the trauma room must ramp up for action. Is there another one? Circulating nurse Russ gets the story and preps the team. There's somebody to fall from the tree. There's somebody called 911 and the chopper picked them. Where are they? Sunnybrook. Oh, yeah, that's right. Hospital. 63. Hi, sir. What's, What's your name? Thomas Dr. Dr. Tiana. Mark, 45 meters. Oh, yeah. Do you remember everything that happened? Well, I was up there cutting a the tree with a um, uh, chainsaw. 63 year old Thomas was knocked unconscious when he hit his head while falling over six feet from his ladder. And they told me that the tree fell when I hit my head, and that was the end of it. It was about six feet? Yeah, about that. And you remember everything? Yeah, I remember right? that one. Okay. okay. All right. How old are you? 63. Oh, some high yeah. bounce. Right. What, hurt, what hurts when you do that? Um, yeah. my arm. Your arm is hurting, right? Yeah. Okay. What's, uh, what's this big bruise from? Oh, from the tree. The tree? Like it scratched it on its way down? I guess so. Just open your eyes for me as you can. Those are equal. The team quickly learns that Thomas hit his head so badly that keeping constant track of his pupils for possible signs of a head injury is a priority. A priority that Nurse Russ must keep on top of. So far we have one line. So are his pupils? Two and equal. An increase in size or differing sizes could indicate serious trouble. But it's the injuries one can't see to pose the biggest threat. So the team will be primed to look for internal injuries. Sorry, okay. All right, so his fast, initial fast was negative. So far, Thomas is lucky. His fast is negative, and that means no free fluid or blood has been found where it shouldn't be. It now frees up the team to check for broken bones. Uh, no, the arm is not okay. It's fractured. Yeah. Elbow is fractured. Orthopedics have arrived to assess Thomas's mangled elbow. It's exposed and puts him at risk for infection. But there's also the chance that an important vessel's been severed and starving his limb to death from loss of circulation. We have to look at the x-ray first and see what kind of fracture he had. And then we have to take it to the, uh, to the OR for, to wash your uh, okay. fracture. Because it's well, open. a fracture, that means a crack. Right? Crack, crack okay. in your bone, in your not elbow. Broken. Not broken, no. It's broken. It is, right? It is broken. Oh, okay. Is that in a bad spot to fix? Uh, we can't tell. I have to look at the extra first. Mm -hmm. But it's in your elbow. It's comminuted. It means like it's tiny pieces. Oh, okay. I can, that I can see from the uh, cut itself. Thomas needs surgery. It's the only way to set the fracture and ensure no vessels have been damaged. 
But with such a severely shattered elbow, it is doubtful Thomas will ever regain full use or feeling in his arm. But while waiting for OR, it'll leave a scar. Dr. Tian will have to repair the deep gash on his head to stave off an infection to his face. In trauma medicine, teamwork is everything. It is quite a teamwork. Um, sometimes it's, it's more than just doctors and nurses. It's like we're all part of one team. We rely on each other. If you don't work as a team, then nothing's going to be done properly, and it's not. It's just, I think it's all about flow. Get all nervous, and you know your head is spinning, but you know you, you love it. I think all of us have a little bit of, a, of an adrenaline. We're junkies, I guess, really enjoy it. And adrenaline runs high for patients, too, like 63-year-old Thomas, another patient under Russ's care. He lies beat from a six-foot fall from a ladder that he was standing on to trim limbs from a tree. He shattered his elbow into tiny fragments. It's broken. Your elbow, it's comminuted. It means like it's tiny pieces. Threatening the use of his arm. If he severed vessels there as well, he may lose it altogether. While awaiting OR, a large head wound gets urgent stitching. It'll leave a scar. It'll be a uh, hit in the head with a tree uh, story, for sure. Okay, some cold cleaning, okay? This is going to sting a little, okay? Close your eyes. So I'm going to give you a bit more pain medication, okay? All right, I'm just going to freeze the area, okay? The deep gash on his head is only one site where infection can creep in. The open fracture on his elbow needs to be fixed in OR right away. Okay, let's go, let's go. And the team will need x-rays. Okay. All right. All right, that's good. While they wait for the x-rays to develop, Dr. Tian must finish the sutures. Oh, they're gonna come together nicely. Good job. He'd also lost consciousness or he was slightly amnestic to the event so we're going to scan his head to make sure nothing is going on but he's awake and talking so I don't, I don't anticipate anything serious going on in his head. The most rewarding aspect is really when you can go a few days later and visit someone and they're sitting up eating their breakfast or they're on the floor and their families around them holding their hands. Nothing better than that, that's the best. Most rewarding to see the patients after. You can actually see the difference that you made and then see them come walking down the hall with a smile on their face is phenomenal. One patient that's done well is Laura. It's been six weeks since her head-on collision. The trauma team made the right decision. Her internal bleeding stopped without the need for surgery, but she has a long road of recovery ahead of her. So it was three weeks in the hospital, and then now three weeks here. So I guess it's been essentially six weeks since the surgeries and everything that, that had happened. So we're gonna try the stairs today for the first time. We're gonna assess today to see if she can get her license to be independent. So we're gonna start with the small stairs. This, well, this is a really positive place, and um, they always focus on the things that you can do. And I walk by the nurse's desk in a walker or something, they're just as excited to see me doing that, you know, as I am to be doing it. So I think that also helps. So we're gonna practice this way for now. Okay. Laura was a new mom when her accident happened. Her baby was just three months old, and Laura has yet to comfortably hold her baby girl again who miraculously was unharmed from the crash. For me, I feel a bit robbed of the, my maternity leave because I, I'm, uh, you know, missing this valuable time with my daughter. You know, when you're three and a half months, four months, you change every day. So I do feel a bit sad about that. Um, but like I say, it, you also have to just get focused to say, well, I'm just gonna strengthen myself as much as I can, and I'm gonna get myself so I can go home. You know, and that's really your goal is that, you know, so that you can go home and start to lead your regular life again. You look great for the first time, I'll tell you that much. Good, good.
One of the satisfying things is, uh, you know, we don't get, often get to see it in, in emergency or in trauma medicine. It's the progression towards getting better. You know, you realize that, that what you do here in this environment does make a big difference in the end because you, you can get kind of sheltered from it over the course of time. And one of Russ's patients that has done well is 63-year-old Thomas. He had fallen over six feet from his tree while trimming branches. He was taken to CT scanning, and as suspected, his elbow was badly fractured and needed surgery. But there's good news. He was spared any brain injuries. I didn't feel anything at the time. And then all of a sudden, an ambulance guy came and he says, no, you've had an accident. You'll be down in Sunnybrook in about 10 minutes. And as sick as I was, I really got off on that because I like helicopters. But then I remember I was in that trauma center, and, you know, stuff is kind of fuzzy, but I was very impressed with the nurses and the doctors. Like, how would I say they were short, sweet, concise, and to the point, and yet they said, well, this is what's wrong, this is what we're going to do, and that you could follow it, you know what I mean? The worst part, I guess, was the elbow where the two little bones came out the back. And you know what? Without a word of light, all my fingers, I got complete sensitivity. And as far as my finger could go, you wouldn't know a bit of difference. And um, very minimal pain compa compared to what happened, you know what I mean? I'm in the funeral business, funeral director. And it was funny, I used to, I always have seen the funeral business, you know, I used to say, you would get these bodies in there and they'd have all that stuff in them. I said, oh God, I hope I can get through life without getting plugged into the wall like this or a nursing home. I hate nursing homes. And sure enough, this happens, and I'm plugged into the wall. Like <laughs> I said, oh, God, <laughs> you know, I met the lucky. Eh? But at least it wasn't for too long. Another patient doing well is 18-year-old David, still recovering from a gunshot wound to the chest. Shot at close range, David's assailants are still being hunted by police. He is very lucky to be alive, but still in emotional shock. My face not fit anymore. Missed my heart. Uh, it went, it just punctured the lung, my right lung. And the doctor said it ricocheted off my rib and that's some of my body right now. And I'm not gonna do surgery or anything. I'm just gonna wait till it comes out. I'm happy that it just was my heart. So I'd be dead right now, you know? Guess I changed my life a bit. I had a tube in me that I just, just took out about like an hour ago. So well, the doctor said, when that's out, I can go home. So I probably have to go home like tomorrow or something when my parents come back. David's shock is shared by 17-year-old Carl. Luckily, he gets to go home. He's leaving Sunnybrook today after a harrowing schoolyard experience. Well, it was in defending a friend that I got stabbed. Lucky enough that I held my wound as soon as I, as soon as I, I guess as soon as I saw the blood gushing, I held it tight. It was a scary thing, very painful, but I knew like it, it had people around me that were professionals and knew what they were gonna do. Uh, just the most important thing is that I'm here and I'm still alive, you know. Another fortunate teen survives a drastic act of violence, but is on the road to recovery thanks to Sunnybrook's trauma team. Sometimes patients come down and they say thanks. That's amazing. Someone's saying, no, thank you. Thank you for your help or thank you for spending the time with me. And it's uh, amazingly gratifying when you see a patient who you didn't think was going to survive. And then to see them come walking down the hall with a smile on their face is phenomenal. And just knowing that, you know what, you do make a difference. And that's, to me, that's what satisfies me. Okay. Thank you.